Hello everyone, this is Scott Geider, a.k.a. Gruesome Herzog, and the character of Cephas from the hit franchise series, The Hillbilly Horror Show. My very special guest is a uh, filmmaker that I've met on the set of Hillbilly Horror Show Volume 4, and he has a gem. If you're into independent, uh, low budget, uh, no budget, or just horror films, period, you have a guy here that made a documentary about behind the scenes, and it's called Blood on the Real. My very special guest is Johnny Daggers. Johnny, how are you? I'm good, sir. How about yourself? I met you in the set of Hillbilly Horror Show, yes. Volume 4. Yes, you did. I surprise. And this is before Blood on the Real was uh, made, obviously. And I was supposed to appear on it, but uh, you know, it didn't quite work out, so... It is what it is. Uh, you got to check out uh, behind the scenes of the Hillbilly Horror Show, Volume 4, I think it was. We shot, was it 3 and 4, I think we shot then. I do believe so, yeah. And uh, it was good uh, meeting you and hanging out and talking. and and. Uh, but here you go. It's now released about, what, a year and a half later or something like it's, that? Maybe? That sounds about right. I think once I sent it over to the distribution company, SGO Entertainment, it took them about a year to get everything ready for Blu-ray and DVD and all the distribution crap that has to be done so yeah it was, it was about that <laughs> but you know what i did watch it on amazon prime if you guys have amazon prime you can watch it for free there um there's nothing like watching it on the tv set i mean using movies i get i'll get links and i'll watch it on my computer because it's easy obviously but uh i was checking it out michael rodriguez is a friend of mine who i got to know through the business great guy um yes uh it's a voice of work for him in the past in some of his trailers, and, uh, and the movie hits right where it should be. I mean, independent films, people, for instance, I'm in independent films, and you are, and, and if it weren't normal Joe Schmo or Nancy Fancy would see you on Amazon Prime, will see you, and they're going to think, oh, man, he's rich. He's rich yeah. if he's in a movie. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's funny when I tell people what I do. Well, why are you working here? Well, you know, I said, well, you know, it's not easy as that. I said, and then the next question is, oh, so you do back backyard films? I said, no, they're not backyard films. They're independent films. The budgets are a lot lower than the average high budget film. And but I always tell people, if you are a fan of film, then. You know, venture into the independent and the lower budgets because you know what? You get more of a storyline, more uh, attempts, more daring. You know what I mean? With the high budget films, they have to be careful of what they do because all this money is being used. And a lot of times, corners are cut. You know what I mean? But me being a reviewer since 2010, I've seen so many, especially no budget, low budget films mm -hmm. and, and, I love. You're gonna think I'm weird, but I love films that are a lot of mistakes. I mean, you know, I mean, especially when it's their first one. Because I look at a film not because there's mistakes. I look at a film because, wow, you know, I know this guy before. I talked to him before. Now the product is finished. I know what I'm getting myself into. But to start a project and to get it done is a feat of its own. There's nothing like a good film that has heart. You know what That's I mean? exactly what I was going to add to that, is that with the independent films, whether it's independent horror comedy, regardless, you get the heart. Because Hollywood's driven by money, and they're, they're, it's not really driven by heart. I've worked on Hollywood sets, you know, I'm sure you have too. And, you know, you just see it. It's The only reason is for monetary purposes, for the most part. So, you know, you have an independent filmmaker, like the people that I have featured in Blood on the Real... You know, we've sometimes risked our live, lives, which I talk about in the documentary. Uh, we, you know, give up. I, there were times I didn't know if my mortgage payment was going to go through. I mean, you're literally laying everything that you have on the line. And you lose friendships because of it, because you're no longer hanging out at the bars or clubs, partying. You're at home focusing on your art and trying like hell to complete your film, which most independent filmmakers aren't lucky enough to do. There are so many films that fall to the wayside. I've had it happen to me it, once in the past. And, uh, you know, so to truly see a film from concept to the screen is an amazing thing. And then to be able to get distribution is a whole entire other can of worms, but yeah, yeah. These, these are some things that we tackle in the documentary. Well, you know, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up, but I'm not going to mention names mm -hmm. or, or the film. But 
In June 4th of 2012, I auditioned for a small part as a bartender for a film, and we shot it in New York. You know, my first experience, and it was cool. I mean, you know, I was excited, you know. Right. And, then, and then all of a sudden, uh, I guess about a year later, um, the person who was in this film um, moved to Florida to his parents due to his issues, whatever. And then he decides, well, let's reshoot the bar scene down here in Florida. Mm. All these promises, you know, Disney's going to get involved in it, you know. And guess what? It's still on the shelf four years later. Right. You know what I mean? It's like karma. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying, it's not just me, but the scene that we did end up being, was supposed to be an extra in the DVD, and they reshot this new scene, you know. Right. But it's still on the shelf, and it's been four years. So it's like, it happens. I mean, actors have to be thick skinned. You know, it really pissed me off. Right. I mean, because the person who did it was supposed to be my best friend. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't the fact of being cut, being redone. It's the fact they didn't even tell me. It was a big secret. And all of a sudden, they're releasing all these, you know, it's whatever. But it happens. I mean, if you want to be an actor in this industry, it's going to happen. I mean, you have to be thick skinned and deal with it. But a lot of films that put a lot of heart into them never see the light of day. Yeah. Very true. Because it causes problems. John and Bobby are best friends. They decide to make a film. <laughs> they both put some money in this film. Oh, they get in a fight. And guess what happens? It's done. It's stalled. Yeah. Because now they both don't get along, and then one can't complete it without the other one. Without the, you know, and it happens. A lot of people in this, in, in this world who watch films, who go to Netflix, who go to anywhere and watch these films, independent films are more available now than they were six years ago. They really are. I started six years ago, and if you would have asked me back then if I would have ever had a distribution deal and been on the shelves at all major retailers, yeah. I would have thought you were crazy. But, you know, luckily it happened for me, and, and, you know, that's always my advice to aspiring filmmakers is just pick up a camera and do it, and you might have success with it. So, And yeah. if, if you don't, at least you tried. It's better than laying on your deathbed wondering what if, so... Yeah, you're right. It's like a lot of these films are coming on uh, the what's that uh, video box that Turkey Hills have or all these what's that called Red Box? Okay, it's funny. People, are, uh, friends of mine, are going, "Hey, did you see that movie on Red Box? It's pretty good." I said, "Oh yeah, I saw that three years ago." Mm -hmm. So being the reviewer, I get the screeners, and sometimes it takes three years for it to get released right. in the Red Box. But it's pretty cool that films that us reviewers watch. Are now are available for people in the public for these red boxes or Amazon, and it's pretty cool for the filmmaker to all that hard work, sweat, you know, and waiting and waiting, and and then that product is out. I mean, a lot of films goes to Walmart. Okay, so what? It's in a five dollar bin, but you know what? It's being sold exactly at a Walmart for somebody to come and see. Now, I don't agree with a lot of the films that do get distro deals because a lot of it is. Favoritism, right. a lot of garbage got, got uh, deals that suck. And I mean, I'm being honest, and there's other films that are fantastic that never see a light of day or even see a distribution deal because it all comes down to, you know, how many times have you slapped my back or yeah. whatever. It happens. I mean, and It's the same way with you, film festivals, yeah. too. That's why I refuse oh, to ever pay oh. to submit to a film festival because I've seen film festivals that I didn't even submit to, but I've seen... You know, mm -hmm. festivals where there's so much nepotism involved, and yep. you have all these people who, you know, they just sunk all their savings into making their film, and now festivals want to turn around and say, okay, well, by the way, if you want to submit your film, it's X amount of money, and, you know, there's not a guarantee that we'll see it, and, and, and we're going to say that we've seen it, and, and, and we, we reject your film because my buddy Bobby has a film that I want to put in there and screw you, but we got your money and go. Exactly. It happens. Now, a Fantastic Horror Film Festival in San Diego, which I am a producer of that, if this film or any film that you want to submit, it's one of the most reasonable, uh, honest... Because I'm, I'm not saying that because of me, because I'm a producer and I'm in charge of the reviewers, the people who review the films, and I've seen a lot of films that got ignored by other festivals that were submitted into that festival and it won awards. Because it's for the fans. It's not for, hey, buddy, I'll put your film in here. I'll slap your ass and say, but I'm just being honest 
There's a lot of film. The reason why it's funny you mention that because when I mentioned about films that are crap that got distro deals, I'm not going to mention the film festival at all. But this film never crossed my desk to judge, and it won best feature. Wow! How is that possible? Yeah, exactly. It never crossed my desk, and it's a garbage shit film. Right. And I seen it at Walmart for five bucks. I'm thinking, oh great! I'm glad you made it there. But, you know what I mean? It's because if a film wins awards at a film festival, a distro deal will come sooner because their film won awards. And that was all, I'll help you get your film distroed, no matter if it sucks or it's good. It happens. There's a lot of festivals that are like that. And it's sad. I mean, I can go on about that. Being a reviewer, I deal with it all the time. Certain states have festivals. And if you're not from that state, you will not win. It's just the way it is. Your film, Blood on the Reel, hits home, makes people who don't understand about filmmaking exactly what goes into it. You don't have these high, fancy safety nets. You don't have, you know I mean? It's guerrilla style, but not guerrilla style. You really have to have the heart to keep going because you can shoot one month, a month later, there could be nothing. You can't find it. You want a place to shoot it at, but they won't let you. You have to get zoning and all this crap. Or the cops are called on you because you're filming 10, 11 o'clock at night because people think that someone's getting murdered. You go through a lot. Am I yeah, right, John? Oh, yes. Mostly all of those have happened to me. In fact, even on my current film that we're in production with right now, Noctambulist, um, there's, it's a 1920s black and white silent horror. And nice. for the... Uh, opening of the movie, we have a cocktail party scene, and we had this really extravagant ballroom that just looked the very 1920s aesthetics that we needed, and we were told that we could shoot there free of charge. We had the entire night to ourselves, and um, then about three months later, so we're going along, and this is pre-production, and everything's rolling smoothly, and then about a month before we start filming, we find out that the ma new management took over and now we're no longer to film no longer able to film there so then we had to go back in have another meeting and say look you know you really need to honor the agreement with the previous management and had to fight with them but then luckily they agreed uh, you know let us film there again and then this time they wanted to charge us and we're like no 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 that's not what was <laughs> you know written in the original right. agreement so you go through a lot of that you know as an independent mm -hmm. filmmaker so and i mean i'm sure some of that shit happens in hollywood too but it's a lot more common in the indie world, and because uh, it's not like we're big li uh, big wigs with you know uh, fancy attorneys and lots of money to take somebody to court if they were <laughs> to, to screw you out of the location. But yeah, the, um, uh, there's all those issues. I mean, I was I don't want to give too much away because a lot's in the documentary. But I've, I've yeah. nearly been shot filmmaking without going into further details. I've nearly been fined. I've had locations dropped. I mean, yeah, you name it. it. You know, it happens to us. And back in the day, when I first started in 2010, it was really a lot more guerrilla-style filmmaking than it is now. You learn to progress and refine yourself over the years. And, you know, now we try to go about things properly with at least getting permission. Uh, we may not go through all the necessary bullshit to get permits because they can charge you out the ass for that. Uh, <laughs> but it, we do try to make sure that at least we have permission to be on the premise so that, you know, we don't run the risk of being shot and or have the cops call it on us. So... Well, you know what? Let, let's go back a few years. Let, let, let's go back to 2010. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run some films here. And so the people who are listening, fans of short films or film period, let's talk about, uh, is it Samhain, Night Feast, yeah. 2010? Yes, it is. Now, what is this about, and uh, how, how was it perceived, or has anybody seen it? Uh, yeah, it was actually the film that launched my career. Uh, oddly enough, I just, in 2010, I was pretty sick and tired of what Hollywood had to show and just wanted to make a film for myself and my friends to enjoy. So we made a 20 minute short. It was pretty much an excuse just to get together with my friends, drink, have a good time and shoot a short little film. Never expected anybody else to see it outside of, you know, my circle of friends. Um, somehow, unbeknownst to me, about maybe a month after the film was done, I got an email that somebody at the Bachelors of Horror Short Film Festival in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania had saw the film and wanted to screen it. 
So I contacted them, asking them if this was true, to which they confirmed, and gave me two free tickets. So I show up with no expectations whatsoever. I had about a case of beer with me, and I was just there to party, and it was just kind of cool. You know, hey, I get to see my film on the screen. Never thought that that would happen. So um, long story short, uh, the film's over. I get a standing ovation and find out that the film won the short film fest and they invited me up to do a Q&A afterwards and it was amazing and I thought if we could actually make a 20 minute short film with no prior schooling just something you know for myself and my friends if we could do that and win a short film festival what could happen if we actually started an actual production company and went legit so that was pretty much my foray into filmmaking and we've been going ever since so now, is that available for anybody to watch? It is not. Uh, it was available because this was prior to my distribution deals. Um, since Blood on the Real, everything I release here on out will be released through SGL Entertainment. Uh, but this was prior to my distribution deal, so that was all, you know, somebody ordered it from my website. I physically went to the post office, shipped it out to them. And, you know, it had a lot of orders overseas when it was for sale online, especially in Germany and in Europe, who are a lot more open and accepting of independent films than we are here yeah. in the U.S. Um, but then, it, you know, the funny thing is, is it won a short film festival, so you think I'd be showing it all over the world. Uh, but once I got to a point in my career where I learned what I was doing and, and became comfortable with what I was doing, I didn't want anybody to see that. I'm like, oh, shit, that's so old. Like, oh, it was so, you know, it's like, you know yeah, it won an award, but I, I just kind of still don't like to show it to people just because the things that I'm doing now are just so much better that, than what that was. And I guess, you know, maybe it should be released for the world again, and maybe I should put it up for sale on my website uh, with the accolades that it received. But again, the direction that I'm going as a filmmaker is, like I said, I'm currently working on a 1920s black and white silent film. And my direction, my inspirations have always been the early 1900 turn of the century uh, silent films, German expressionist films like Gollum and Nosferatu and Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Metropolis. So that's the direction that I've always wanted to go my entire life. I just had to build up to that, and now I'm in a position to be able to do that. So my film after Noctambulist might not be a silent, but it'll definitely be in the noir type category and uh you know so it's like i'm trying to separate myself from what i've done in the past not that i'm embarrassed of those films but it's always about progressing and moving forward and taking uh you know my films in the direction that that i want to go to and i guess in a way since sam hay night feast was a 20 minute black and white you know short film in, in a way it does have that kind of noir type element um and it's it's a zombie film which i have vowed never to make another zombie film again um <laughs> i think the market's so <laughs> oversaturated with oh, them at the yeah. moment and you know when my career first started everybody was comparing me to you know the next george romero because i did sam hay night feast which was a zombie film that happens on trick-or-treat and uh obviously given the name uh sam hayne or Sawin. and then I, that was followed up by my next film caustic zombies yeah. so yeah. after that that was all right before walking dead happened and the whole zombie explosion happened and then once walking dead came on and you can go to walmart now and buy zombie shower curtains and every other car driving down the road has a zombie hunter or zombie survivor sticker yep. on their car. I'm just like, nah, you know what? Zombies are ruined for me. So no more zombie films. But yeah, I'm progressing into, uh, you know, the German expressionist noir, noir type films. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about next. Caustic Zombies 2011. Now, if you watch the documentary, that's being mentioned. Mm -hmm. but I want to hear it. Yeah, you got to say word for word if what the documentary has. But um, you're right. When I started reviewing films in August of 2010, uh, there was a lot of, not a lot, but more discreet zombie films. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a variety of George Romero zombies, and then you started getting these zombie films, which I kind of tend to lean more towards comedy zombie films now right. than the actual ones, because there are so many of them now, and so saturated, that if I see a, a zombie movie... I mean, it would have to be somebody that I know that made one for me to watch it. And I don't mean that to be mean or nothing, but there were so many of them, and there's just it's just Western zombies, you know. Right. But it just gets so saturated that you know, it's one thing. I did a zombie film, as a matter of fact, in uh, March. It's called uh, Papa Primo's Apocalyptic Pizza. It takes place in the pizza shop. 
Okay, I played a character. I played this doomed figure, where I come walking, stumbling into the pizza shop, and I am part human and turning into a zombie. So I'm ordering a pizza, going through the human and zombie form. I mean, that's. I mean, people who watch it, they'll say that's cool. You did a great job. I love. I love your part mm-hmm. because you're stuttering and stuff. But then when you go to the extreme. And then it's like, man, this has been running the mill so many times. Now we got games for the PS4, Zombie Hunter games. Yeah. I mean, what ruined it for me is that Brad Pitt one, what really ruined it for me. They had to make a high dollar zombie film with hardly, I didn't see the film, but I've heard it hardly had any blood or whatever because they don't want to gross people out. I'm thinking, what the fuck are you making a yeah. zombie film if you're worried about grossing somebody out? It just makes no fucking sense. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it myself, but uh, yeah, exactly. It's you know, I mean, years ago, it's, it's the funny thing, and I, I used to talk about this a lot when my when I had a podcast years ago. Uh, the one gripe I had was that Rob Zombie was uh, scheduled to remake The Blob, and one of the things that he had said is that he wasn't going to make it a red blobby thing because that wasn't scary. And I'm like, well, then what the fuck is the point? Like, why do why are you even gonna bother? Just make a completely different movie. Like, why fuck yeah. the Blob? The Blob is a red. That's what it is. It's a red blobby thing. You know, it's, yep, I know. Uh, I mean, we can go on forever about that. But caustic zombies, um, how was it perceived? Or was it also a surprise that people really dug it? I mean, I see a comment that is on IMDb that is ridiculous. It's people are so stupid. I mean, any film that you make, there that never happened at Three Mile Island. Well, no shit. Yeah, wow. I, mean, I haven't really? even seen that comment. But uh, yeah, wow. I. <laughs> Idiots. Now I'm. I do live in Pennsylvania, and the airport is Harrisburg Airport is right in front of Three Mile Island. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I can remember back in the '80s when alarms went off, and it was a big thing back then. But this near, I want to see only for the simple fact is because Three Mile Island is in this film. Now, is there any way that people can see this film, or is it also? There is n- the there is not again any anything prior to my distribution deal was s- all self released so those have all been out of stock because what had happened with Caustic Zombies is it's a feature length film it actually had a sold out premiere uh, at the Hollywood Theater in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania and uh, it was the first time that the theater had ever sold out for an event so we had a awesome red carpet extravaganza for the for the showing and uh, it was great but the, again the problem is with that particular film, um, we ran into issues with our editor at the time, and it was just a lot of personal bullshit that he had. That he, you know, it was basically all in his head, more or less. It really wasn't an issue at all. Um, he thought his girlfriend, who at one time had a crush on me, was. And it's you know, it's one of those type of things, you know. Oh yeah. So uh, you know, all with all that said and done, after the film was finished. Uh, you know, he had months to work on it before the premiere, and I found out the week prior to the premiere that the film was not finished. So I immediately panicked, and I, at that time I had uh, Brian Coddington, who's an independent filmmaker. I was working on his film, Tablet of Tells, and we had just wrapped up his film, and he said, look, man, I got a little bit of time. Uh, you know, I'll go ahead, and if you want, I can you know, edit this for you and make it look presentable for the premiere. So he went ahead and he did that. And, uh, you know, the initial editor got really miffed and decided that he was going to keep all the original footage. So it took us like five years to get the original tapes back because we shot on film. So it took five years to get the original tapes back. And uh, then when we did, the camera in which he had shot on uh, is the only camera that's capable of playing back the footage that we have. And I've searched other um, you know, avenues for people to convert the footage for me and haven't been able to find anybody to do that. So for right now, but I did get to after four or five years, I got all the footage back finally. So it's in my closet wow. and it will be released again someday. Um, but what I did for the time being is I had released an unofficial bootleg version of that movie, uh, the way that it actually screened at the Hollywood Theater for the premiere. So for about two years, uh, we were selling a lot of copies of the official bootleg version oh, wow. and uh, went over really well and 
I had to live true to my word, even though it was selling really good when I first started selling it. I did say that it was only going to be limited edition, and people then would have to wait for the official director's cut once that got put together. So once we sold out, I think I did exceed maybe 70, 75 copies, more than what I said I was going to put out there. And then after that, I'm like, look, man, I got to, if I'm promising limited edition, I got to keep it that way. So Now, Blood on a Reel, I've noticed that one of my guests next week, uh, Genevieve Rossi, uh, be interviewing her next week, and of course, we were in the same film, well, I did my part last summer, and she's going to be doing her part soon, so that's kind of ironic that we're in the same film, and then I, of course, she's in Blood on the Reel. Your experience with the, the people that you met, I mean, mm-hmm. I know Jessica Sonneborn, I interviewed her. I interview James Balsamo. Mm-hmm. I'll be interviewing Genevieve Rossi next week. Um, yeah, you know, Maximilian Max Massimiliano Cerci had Cerci, yep. some. Yep, he had some really strong words that exactly how I feel right. about the whole thing. So, people, if you listen to this interview and you haven't got a chance to order your copy, buy a copy, however you want to see it legally, that is. Uh, Definitely watch this documentary because us independent actors and directors and producers really appreciate if you guys give us a watch because then you understand what we all go through, Mm -hmm. that it's not just a film. It's a baby. It's a baby. You know, it's your baby. That's the end of of the story. And uh, it takes blood, sweat, tears, heart, drama. it takes everything to get that baby made. And, and for you to say, hey, Scott, me, me and Bo were on set and Rachel, and you mentioned that you're going to make mm-hmm. this, and, and you did. I mean, it takes time, for like you said, but you did it. And it's a well-put-together piece Thank that you. I really enjoyed. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was a lot of fun. You know, it, it's one thing I'd like to say to your listeners is it was never my intent to make a documentary. I'm not a documentary style. I love documentaries. I will watch documentaries on anything, anytime, any place. Mm-hmm, I love too. documentaries. But initially, how Blood on the Real happened was I had recently relocated. I split from my partner of Dagger Vision back in 2013. We just wanted to go different ways with our careers and make different type of movies and thought that it would be best for us to remain friends to go our separate ways. And in fact, we are still good friends. He has a podcast and I'm going to be on his show next Tuesday. So we're still good friends, no animosity, but I left him and he had all the equipment. He had the cameras, the lighting, everything that we needed. So when I departed from him and I left Pennsylvania and I moved to Maryland, I was on my own for the first time since 2010. I made Sam Hain Night Feast by myself and same with Caustic, and then Brian and I partnered up after that. Um, But I found myself in a new state with no staff, no equipment, and I was coming up on the five-year anniversary of Dagger Vision Films. And I thought to myself, because I had always promised if we made the five-year mark, which is a damn long time for independent production companies, if we were able to last for five years, I wanted to release something special for the fans. And here I am going on the five year anniversary with no staff, no equipment. I got really depressed and I thought to myself, what the hell am I going to do? So I started thinking about the things that have happened to me over the years. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'll re-release Samhain Night Feast and maybe I'll re-release Caustic Zombies and I'll use these stories as extra DVD footage. Well, then I thought about it and I thought, wait a minute. All of my filmmaker friends have gone through the same things that I have. Why don't I reach out to maybe five or six of these filmmakers, see if they want to share their stories, and we'll do a little documentary. Never intended it to be more than five or six filmmakers. Once word got out, I had literally over 90 filmmakers from around the world contact me and want to be a part of Blood on the Real. They've had these stories. And then it dawned on me, there has never been a documentary on independent filmmakers that focus on the trials and tribulations of the indie horror world. I mean, there's a lot of horror documentaries, but they're either on Hammer Horror or Hollywood Horror, nothing that's really focusing on what the independent guys go through. So what I liked about that is that I had submissions from over 90 filmmakers from all over the world. Now, instead of just a national United States look on what it takes to be an indie horror filmmaker, we have a global perspective. So, you know, we have uh, the evil twins in the documentary who are from the UK. And, you know, we have people like Pete Ellott from New Zealand and, you know, Canadian filmmakers. And so now you have a global perspective of 
what we all go through around the world, because in some other countries, it's easier to get government funding to make a film. It's not here in the U.S., but, you know, we see all of this in Blood on the Rail, and I just thought that was a really neat thing to show people, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to use all of that footage. Obviously, the documentary is two hours long, and there was no way that I could exceed that time frame, so people like Giovanni Rossi and, you know, people... Uh, like David Blythe, who's a filmmaker in New Zealand, uh, who actually directed the first couple episodes of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers back in the day, uh, yeah, and it, people yeah. like Blue de Goyer, uh, who's doing the Hillbilly Horror Show, those all had to get pushed to Blood on the Real Part 2, which will be in the works in the not-so-distant future. So um, anybody that didn't get to have their interviews featured in the initial Blood on the Real they will be in the second one. And that was just basically due to time restraints. You know, I couldn't exceed the two-hour threshold. Um, but everybody said that it flowed really well and that the pace kept up, that it never once got boring and lulled. So uh, they said that, you know, it was, was enjoyable. So I'm happy for that. Oh, fantastic uh, documentary. I, Thank you. I mean, I understand it, obviously, because I'm a reviewer and I'm in the industry. But this is a nice little learning piece for people who don't understand film to get an idea, you know what, I get it, I get it. So maybe they won't be so harsh on a film that, you know, that they don't quite understand what it takes. Well, actually, may may I interject real quick? I'll tell you a Mm -hmm. funny story for your listeners. Yeah, sure. And it goes, it coincides exactly with what you're saying. So Blood on the Real screened three times now prior to its release, actually. It screened on Halloween last year at the Virginia Indie Horror Film Festival. And that was amazing. I got to go down to Virginia on Halloween and have Blood on the Real in front of everyone. And the funny thing about it is when I show up there, I get introduced to the MC of the evening. He walks up, he introduces himself and says, I just wanted to let you know because it's presented by the Virginia Film Club. So uh, the MC said to me, I have to be honest with you. I'm going to be the one, you know, showing your film this evening, and I am not a fan of horror movies. I'm thinking to myself, oh, this, this is just fantastic. He said, but I can't wait to see the documentary. I'm curious to hear the stories. So Blood on the Real Screens, it was really well received. And afterwards, that same MC approached me and said in front of everybody, not only... Did I love Blood on the Real, but I have a newfound respect for independent horror films. And he actually had a notebook of about six, probably five or six filmmakers that he wanted to check out after that. And he said that I've come. So a, fa- a person that wasn't even a fan of independent horror films was completely converted after watching Blood on the Real. And that was one of the best compliments that I think anybody could ever you know, pay me. So That's awesome. And, and that just tells you that a lot of people hear the word independent. They put their nose up. Yeah. You know? Because it's not something that they see commercials on TV for. And, you know, it, it is what it is. But you know what? More and more and more, these same people are starting to go the opposite way. Because you can go to Redbox and get that film that you don't know nothing about. And you end up loving it. Right. You know? So it is what it is. Well, Johnny, I want to thank you for coming on. It was great having thank you. Thank you, Scott. I mean, it was Pleasure being. It's been, it's been a long time. I've been in hiatus since March. been very busy. But... I got a chance to watch this, and I contact you. I said, "Let's get this done." I appreciate I mean, it. Obviously, we hung out and met uh, yeah. a while ago. So, well, hey, if I can get out to on. the set of Hillbilly Horror Show again, now that I have all my own equipment, I can load up with the camera, and we can, you know, do interviews right on the spot after you guys are done filming for the day. So, that's awesome. We can make this happen and, and get you in blood on the real part too. There we go. Well, it's great having you. You take care of yourself and uh, keep in touch. And I, I'm just hoping that. Uh, this masterpiece of behind the scenes that people, you need to see it. Before we go, mention to the people where they can get it. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Best Buy, Walmart, FYE, Target, Kmart, any of the major retailers. So There you go. And same goes for the Hillbilly Horror Show, www.hillbillyhorrorshow.com. There's links there. You can get it also at Walmart and Best Buy and so forth. So people, thanks for listening. Uh, definitely check out Blood on the Real, and of course, definitely check out Hillbilly Horror Show because we also support the independent filmmaker with their short films. Johnny, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, listeners. Take care. Hey, you too. We'll see you.